So we're going to get started now. So it's a pleasure to have Dr. Connor Liston here for today's seminar, which is sponsored by the Ludma Center. So Dr. Connor Liston uh, did his PhD, co-mentored by BJ Casey and Bruce McEwen, two giants in their fields, at the Rockefeller. And he then went on to do a part-time postdoc while he was completing his residency at NYU with Wen Bao Gan. And then after that, he went on to a second postdoc with Carl Dysroth at Stanford. And he was then recruited back to Weill Cornell, where he set up his own group uh, about four years ago. So Connor is an unusually uh, interdisciplinary scientist. And he's also a practicing clinician. So in his lab, Connor uses cutting edge imaging techniques combined with tools like optogenetics and in vivo imaging with computational methods to answer both basic and applied research questions. The main focus of his lab currently is in understanding how prefrontal cortical microcircuits uh, participate in cognition and how spine remodeling contributes to circuit function and behavior. But actually today, he's not going to give us that talk. <laughs> He's going to tell us about some other work in his lab that used resting state fMRI to identify subtypes in depression. So earlier this summer, I was at a conference on the future of computational psychiatry, and Dr. Josh Gordon, who is the head of the NIMH, uh, talked about this work from Connor Liston as the future of computational psychiatry and how computational methods can inform this emerging field. So I won't say anything more about this. I will just introduce Dr. Connor Liston. Well, thank you, Rose, for that very generous in, uh, introduction. Um, and thank you as well um, to uh, the Joanne and the whole Ludmer Center for um, hosting this trip. It's been a lot of fun. Um, and I want to thank all of you guys for coming out today, despite all the snow. Um, I hope I will make it worthwhile. Um, I move forward. There we go. All right. Um, so uh, as Rose mentioned, uh, the work I'm going to describe today um, was uh, motivated by an interest in understanding this um, long-standing kind of vexing question um, in psychiatry, which relates to uh, the heterogeneous um, diagnoses that, that, that we deal with. Um, depression isn't just one thing. It's not a unitary phenomenon. It's a word for a syndrome um, that uh, describes a bunch of symptoms that tend to co-occur in many individuals um, and, uh, and tend to respond similarly to treatment. Um, but no one really thinks that depression um, has a strong correspondence to just one biological substrate in the brain in all people. Um, and that turns out to be an important obstacle, especially for research, um, for making progress in our understanding of the, the neurobiology of depression and for developing new treatments. Um, and I think that contributes in part to, to these statistics that we see here, which are um, troubling um, and uh, frustrating for, for patients and for their doctors. Um, psychiatric illnesses uh, now account for five of the 10 leading causes of disability. Um, and by this particular measure, um, years of life lost to the burden of the illness, um, depression is the leading cause of disability. Um, in 2010 dollars in the US, um, we spent uh, 210 billion dollars um, on depression, on lost productivity due to depression, on treating depression, and on treating medical problems worsened by depression. Um, and those numbers are surely even larger today. Um, and uh, much of that um, relates in part to the difficulties in finding the right treatment for the right individual patient. Um, for the most part, we rely on a trial and error approach to treatment selection um, that's, that's frustrating and doesn't serve uh, doctors or patients well, um, but it's, it's the method that, uh, that, that we have to use for now um, because for the most part, uh, biomarkers for, for diagnosing uh, depression subtypes and for uh, informing clinical decision making about which treatments are most likely to be effective, they're, they're lacking in depression. Um, and again, uh, I think that has a lot to do with um, this problem of diagnostic heterogeneity. So let's think about it a little further. 
Um, we diagnose depression today when you have five or more of these nine symptoms, um, according to the, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the DSM. Um, and that means, just doing a little simple math, that there are at least 256 unique combinations that you can present with and still meet criteria for depression. And that's not even accounting for the fact that some of these criteria contain opposites of themselves, like weight loss or weight gain, insomnia or sleeping too much. Um, and I think it uh, is kind of intuitive that uh, probably someone who's presenting to my office complaining of 30 pound weight loss, a lot of anxiety, can only sleep four hours a night, exhausted, profoundly insomniac, physically agitated, can't sit still. Um, uh, this person may not have the exact same problem as somebody who presents with 40 pounds of weight gain, intense carbohydrate craving, sleeping 20 hours a day, can't get out of bed, no energy, no agitation. In fact, they're physically slowed. They, can't, they, they just don't move much spontaneously. They're not anxious at all. They just have uh, a total loss of enjoyment in, of the things that they, that they used to gain pleasure from in life. These people look like opposites of one another in many ways, and yet they get the same diagnosis, and usually they'll get the same treatments um, um, overall. Um, and in, in a way, it's surprising that our treatments work as well as they do. And that's something I always like to emphasize um, in lectures like this, is that um, antidepressants do work. They're, they're helpful. There are treatments out there for people who are depressed. And so it's really important to not be daunted by, um, that, by what I've just told you and, uh, and avoid seeking treatment. They do work, but they could work better. Um, and in particular, I think there's a lot of promise for um, a, a more um, rational approach to uh, selecting treatments that would hopefully dispense with the, with the frustrations of trial and error. So how, how would we go about doing that? Well, one way is to think about um, uh, defining subtypes of depression that have a stronger correspondence to biology. And we've made a lot of progress in this area. Um, we've learned a lot from this work. Um, historically, the way most investigators have gone about thinking about this problem of subtyping and depression is to search for uh, clinical symptoms that tend to co-occur in sets of patients and then ask whether those, um, those kind of putative clinical subtypes have some uh, correspondence with particular biological substrates um, and maybe do they predict differences in responding to particular kinds of treatments. And we've learned a lot from this work. Some of, some of these subtypes like seasonal depression is one that's seeped into the public lexicon. Lots of people are aware of it. This uh, phenomenon that we're probably all aware, I know in New York we are and probably up here in Montreal, um, in winter people tend to get um, lower moods. Um, but the fact remains that uh, for the most part, um, these clinical subtypes of depression um, are not associated with reliable biological markers that are in widespread use um, in clinical practice for diagnosing them, um, and nor do they have really strong correspondences to which treatment is most likely to be effective. There are some, there are some exceptions, but that's, that's generally the rule. So our approach here was to kind of flip this chart upside down and ask, instead of clustering people based on their symptoms, let's try to cluster people based on their biology, and then let's ask whether those putative biological subtypes, those clusters, are predictive of different kinds of clinical symptoms um, and different patterns of responding to particular treatments. Um, and that, of course, begs the question, what biological measure would be useful? Um, we knew we would need a lot of data to do this, um, and, uh, and, and we, we also know that um, there's a pretty large body of work now um, uh, using resting state fMRI um, to uh, identify uh, differences in the way brain networks are functionally organized in patients with depression. Um, there are strong differences in people with depression. Um, and there happens to be uh, nowadays quite a lot of data out there um, uh, using this modality that can, in principle at least, be integrated across different scanners and, and, and combined. That's a technical problem, um, one that I'll talk more about in the, in the methods talk um, later this afternoon. Um, but, uh, but in principle, um, you should be able to combine data across scanners. Um, and for those unfamiliar with this method, um, it's based on this uh, seminal discovery by uh, Barat Biswell and Mark Rakel some years ago now, 15, 20 years ago, that the brain at rest exhibits these spontaneous fluctuations um, in the MR um, bold signal, and that's what you see depicted at the upper right. Um, on the lower left, you see uh, a typical MRI brain scan. There's the kind of scan you might get if you um, went to an emergency room and uh, your doctor was worried about a, a head injury or a stroke. Um, this kind of MR scan can be sensitized uh, to um, differences in oxygenation in the blood, which are in turn a proxy for brain activity. Um, and uh, it turns out that 
uh, even at rest, the brain exhibits spontaneous fluctuations in that, in that MR bold signal. And uh, importantly, uh, those fluctuations tend to be correlated in regions of the brain that are strongly functionally connected. Uh, and that's what you see in this pair of regions um, at, at top, a blue one and a red one. They're neuroanatomically far apart in the brain, um, but they exhibit strongly correlated uh, bold signal fluctuations over time. Um, and these brain regions also happen to be um, strongly uh, functionally connected in various task contexts. Um, so you can use this method, and many others have done this. This is, uh, definitely did not originate with us. Um, you can use this method to characterize um, how different brain regions are functionally connected. Uh, it's important to emphasize here for um, people who are interested in this um, that uh, monosynaptic connectivity, structural connections between these brain regions um, do appear to influence the correlations that we're observing, but they're not determining those correlations. Other factors also determine them. But uh, you can think of these um, as, as a way of measuring um, functional connectivity. And for the remainder of the talk today, I'm going to be ta talking about functional connectivity measures. And, and this is what I mean, how bold signal fluctuations are correlated between regions over time. Um, OK. Um, so. We have these brain scans. We knew we would need a lot of them. Um, and so the first thing uh, we did in my lab was uh, approach a bunch of people all over the country and, uh, and uh, up in Canada as well. Um, and basically, um, everyone I knew and a lot of people I didn't, I begged them to share their data with me. Um, and the people you see photographed here are the people who were generous enough to, to do this. They really made the work possible. I like to highlight them right up front. Um, without their contributions, none of this could have been done. Um, they're based uh, all over the country, as you see at left. Um, and most of the work I'm going to present today um, was uh, derived from analyses of uh, this first data set, data set one, which was 711 subjects, 333 unipolar depressed patients that were scanned at five different scanners, five different sites. And we used this data to discover the, uh, the clusters, the subtypes I'm about to describe, um, to uh, to optimize methods for diagnosing them in individual patients and for understanding uh, how they relate to clinical symptoms. And then secondly, uh, for machine learning aficionados in the room, you're probably aware that these methods are kind of notorious for overfitting to idiosyncrasies in the data that they're trained on. So it's really important uh, in order to be confident in your results to have uh, independent data that you can uh, attempt to replicate um, your, your, your most important findings in. And that's where this second data set came in. This was 477 subjects, 215 unipolar depressed patients from four scanners. Um, including scanners that were that were not included in data set one from from uh, new investigators um, th these were data that basically weren't uh, either they weren't collected yet or they weren't initially available to us when when the study started and we used this data set to to replicate some of our most important results um, okay I'm gonna next jump into just an overview of the methods I want to highlight here um, two people um, who uh, really were critical in this work Andrew Drysdale a really talented MD PhD student who's now a psychiatrist resident at uh, Wash U, um, and uh, Mark Dubin, uh, my colleague at Cornell, is the single largest contributor of data to this project. I'm really grateful to Mark for making this work possible. Um, this is kind of a bird's eye overview of uh, what we did in this project so far. And uh, for those of you interested in uh, learning more about the details, um, I'll be talking about that in the, in the methods talk uh, at uh, 1 o'clock. Um, and uh, please also save your questions. Ask me questions about this um, at the end. I'm happy to delve into anything that interests people. But the overview was, first, we identified uh, connectivity features, features in the kind of whole brain architecture of functional connectivity that correlated with specific symptom combinations. And then using these features, we tested whether they tended to cluster in subgroups of patients. Could we, could we identify clusters of patients, putative subtypes of depression, um, by looking at um, which alterations occurred in which patients? Uh, then we asked, um, could we uh, train statistical classifiers, um, you, you can think of as um, neuroimaging biomarkers, for diagnosing these subtypes and differentiating them from healthy controls in individual, in individual subjects? Uh, and then finally, um, we tried to uh, replicate those biomarkers in an independent sample, and we uh, tested, most importantly, whether the uh, subtypes were predictive of interesting differences in clinical symptom profiles and, and maybe, most importantly, in, in, in responding to treatments. And uh, that's, that's what I'll kind of focus on uh, for the next few minutes. Okay. Um, 
this gives you a sense of the data that we're working with. Um, we experimented with different methods of parcelating the brain. Um, we don't want to analyze every voxel for, for various reasons. Um, the method that um, we ultimately settled on um, and that I'm going to focus on today is this uh, 258-node parcellation. It's a functional parcellation of the, of the brain developed by Jonathan Power and Steve Peterson, published in Neuron in 2012. We extract a bold signal time series from each one of these colored nodes, which you see in the upper left. Um, those time series, again, look like the, the blue and red uh, lines um, uh, at the bottom. And then we ask how each time series correlates with every other time series, and that allows us to construct this heat map, which you see um, at the right. This heat map you can think of as a map of the ar architecture of functional connectivity across the whole brain in our subjects. Uh, warm colors denote um, pairs of regions that were strongly positively correlated that tended to go up and down together. Cool colors denote areas that were anti-correlated where one went up and the other went down. And importantly, you can see the individual elements in this heat map are very small, right? Um, there are actually uh, 33 thousand, more than 33,000 unique functional connectivity features in this, in this array. And we, we know um, or we assume that probably most of them have nothing to do with depression. Um, and if we were to cluster patients on all of them, we might discover clusters, but those clusters would also probably have nothing to do with depression. We could talk about what they might be related to, um, but we knew we needed a way of uh, selecting features that were, were important in depression. Um, and ideally, we would also um, prefer to have a method for reducing the dimensionality of this data um, instead of clustering patients on um, lots and lots of features. Um, could we cluster them on a smaller number of variables um, and, and that's important for improving the stability and reproducibility of the results. Um, and the method that we settled on is called uh, canonical correlation analysis. And, and, and this method um, is uh, basically like a um, slightly more complicated um, version of uh, principal components analysis combined with uh, correlations. It asks in a, in a data-driven way whether there are low-dimensional combinations, um, linear combinations of uh, clinical symptoms um, that are correlated with linear combinations of connectivity features. Uh, in other words, can we represent connectivity features in the brain that are important in depression in predicting um, uh, the severity of depressive symptoms? Can we represent them in terms of a small number of variables? And what we found um, it, using a variety of different methods um, over and over again um, was that there were at least two different um, connectivity components which we, for lack of a better word, call anhedonia-related connectivity and anxiety-related connectivity. At left, you see that anhedonia-related connectivity was um, strongly correlated with the severity of patients' anhedonia as, as um, indexed by the Hamilton Depression Rating Scale um, item-level responses, and also to a lesser extent with psychomotor slowing and, and guilty rumination. Um, in contrast, the second component at right, which we call anxiety-related connectivity, was not related to a person's uh, likelihood of being anhedonic. Rather, um, it was um, fairly correlated with uh, a person's um, uh, anxiety symptoms and to a lesser extent also with their insomnia. Um, and, and this kind of made sense intuitively to us um, because uh, we know um, anecdotally from dealing with patients that uh, these two things seem to, anhedonia and anxiety, they seem to vary somewhat independently in people, and, and anxiety often co-occurs with insomnia, um, and so it kind of made sense um, that uh, the clinical symptoms would cluster in this way. Um, having identified these, uh, these uh, components, we then asked, could we cluster patients? Um, and importantly, um, before I jump into telling you about those results, I also want to emphasize um, that, uh, that these, these um, correlations um, are uh, robust and they are stable um, in, in left out data. Um, I'm going to talk a lot more about this in the methods talk because I think it's getting a little bit into the, the, the weeds and the nuts and bolts of this, um, maybe more than a lot of people in this room are interested in it. But, um, it is important um, when you're using methods like this to, uh, to uh, periodically evaluate um, whether the results you're getting reflect overfitting um, in, in the data that they're trained on. Um, and, and we find that uh, this combination of selecting features and then performing canonical correlation analysis, it does indeed tend to overfit um, unless you're careful about it. Um, but we can also show 
um, with a little bit of regularization, um, and I'll get into that in the methods talk, that uh, these uh, canonical correlations are, are stable, they're robust, um, you can detect them in a training sample, you can replicate them in a test sample. Um, we are very convinced that they are real. I can talk more about that um, uh, at the end if anyone is interested in, in understanding more about how we convince ourselves about that. Um, so we've identified these two uh, components, anhedonia-related connectivity and anxiety-related connectivity, and then we next ask, could we, um, how, how did patients uh, cluster along these dimensions? And what we found um, using hierarchical cluster analysis was uh, strong evidence of at least four clusters in our sample. Um, these clusters uh, you see depicted um, both at the, uh, at the left and right in different ways. Um, the uh, dendrogram, the kind of family tree figure that you see at the left, um, uh, tells you information about how uh, the clusters um, are different from one another. Um, the linkages in the tree um, mean something quantitatively. The height of a linkage um, from, I'm gonna use the laser here, yes. The height of this linkage um, from here to the base um, is, is uh, scales with how different are the things being linked. Um, and what you can see are the linkages connecting clusters like this one and this one are much higher than the uh, average height of a linkage between a pair of subjects within a cluster, which are barely visible on, on, at this scale. Um, this dashed line, uh, I, I believe it's um, 20 or 50 times the um, average height of, of a linkage between a, a pair of subjects uh, within a cluster. And, and what this tells you is kind of like an F test in an ANOVA, that the, that the clustering is capturing meaningful variance in the sample, that patients within a cluster are, are quite similar, as you'd expect them to be, that's what clustering analysis does, um, and patients in different clusters are quite different from one another. Um, uh, importantly, um, and we can talk more about this at the end. Um, uh, we talk about in the discussion in this paper, um, we do not believe and we are not making the argument that there are only four subtypes of depression um, or even necessarily that categorical subtyping is the best way to describe these relationships. You might imagine um, that it would be more useful to rate patients dimensionally um, uh, 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 as to where they fall um, on these anhedonia and anxiety related connectivity scores. Um, alternatively, uh, doctors are, um, tend to be used to dealing with uh, categorical heuristics um, when they're thinking about their patients, and uh, categorical subtypes are another way of thinking about this data. And what I'm, what I'm going to try to persuade you of for the remainder of the talk is that this four-cluster solution is a solution that tells us something useful about patients in our sample. It makes predictions about the particular clinical symptoms they're likely to experience. It can tell you something about their treatment response. Um, but it's also definitely driven strongly by the data that we have at hand. Um, and uh, additional data would um, surely be useful in developing um, superior uh, clustering results. We don't think this is the final word in subtyping and depression. Rather, it's one solution, and I'm, and I, and I'm now going to try to persuade you that it is a useful solution. Um, okay. Shifting gears a little bit, um, uh, if you're like me, probably one of the top questions on your mind is, okay, you, you've shown me there are these four clusters in these, in these two dimensions. Um, how do the clusters differ um, in terms of their functional connectivity, and how do they differ in terms of the clinical symptoms they're likely to present with? Um, and this result, uh, the, the, the results I'm about to describe, are necessarily uh, a little complicated um, and, 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 and not straightforward to interpret. Um, that's kind of one of the downsides of a, of a data-driven, um, hypothesis-free approach like the one we took here. Um, but uh, I want to highlight uh, two themes that I think uh, jump out in, in, in the data that, that we have here. One of them is that uh, the subtypes, to some degree, um, share certain connectivity alterations, and that's what you see depicted here. So in this heat map, uh, cool colors denote um, functional connections that are weakened in depression, warm colors denote functional connections that are strengthened in depression, and, and these particular uh, regions have been selected because in our data sets, they are abnormal in all four of the subtypes. Um, so pe people, regardless of their subtype, tend to share these, these alterations. Um, and that led us to ask whether these alterations might also be predictive of clinical symptoms that patients in all four subtypes also tend to share to some degree. Um, and so we just asked 
which clinical symptoms are symptoms that pretty much everyone with depression tends to have at least in a mild form. And what we find is that at least uh, there, are, there are three of them. Um, they, they really stand out. Um, they are depressed mood, anhedonia, and low energy. And in our sample, uh, 97, 96.7, and 94% of patients had at least mild versions of these three symptoms. The next highest was something like 75%. Um, and the degree to which your connectivity was abnormal in these, in these uh, shared connectivity alterations was uh, predictive of the severity of these shared clinical symptoms, and that's what you see depicted here uh, at, the, at the lower left. Um, uh, however, um, superimposed on these shared connectivity alterations are, are other connectivity differences that are specific to the subtypes, and that, of course, also makes sense because we clustered them based on connectivity, and so there should be some connectivity differences, and that's what you see depicted here. Uh, these are different ways of predicting uh, depicting the same results. Um, these are heat masks for subtypes 1, uh, 2, 3, and 4, um, and they show you uh, uh, connectivity alterations in, um, in, in circuits, nodes, uh, that uh, are, are, are exhibiting um, subtype-specific um, connectivity variations. This is another way of looking at that data. This, this tells you something about the an neuroanatomical distribution of the connectivity features that are most subtype specific. Um, and one thing that I want to highlight, I mean, two things actually. Um, one of the areas that stands out is this dorsomedial prefrontal cortical area. Um, here, the, the nodes, the spheres, are scaled as to um, how subtype specific they are. Um, and you can see that kind of the three biggest ones are this dorsomedial prefrontal area, a lateral orbitofrontal area, and a thalamic area. Um, and I'm going to return to that um, uh, when we talk about treatment in a couple minutes. Um, and we also find that, uh, again, just glancing at these maps, um, you don't have to be a statistician to see that they're different. And again, it makes sense that they would be, um, that, that there are at least some connectivity features that, are, uh, that, that vary by subtype. And interestingly, they correlate with clinical symptoms that also vary by subtype. Um, so uh, here, you see um, uh, subtype-specific um, clinical profiles, um, for example, subtypes three and four tend to show elevated levels of anhedonia compared to subtypes one and two. In contrast, subtypes one and four show elevated levels of anxiety compared to two and three. Um, and imp importantly, at this point, we do not know um, whether and how any of those connectivity alterations that I just showed you are actually contributing to the differences in clinical symptoms. Um, but I will point out that there are um, interesting correspondences that emerged in this purely data-driven approach that um, make sense from what we think we know about uh, how the human brain um, works in the context of behaviors that are relevant for depression. I'll highlight just two examples. Um, one, you see that uh, subtypes three and four, uh, there we go, subtypes three and four share this pattern of uh, increased functional connectivity um, between uh, the uh, subcortical regions of cumbens, um, uh, some thalamic areas, uh, ventral striatum, uh, uh, and medial prefrontal areas which have been implicated in reward processing. Those subtypes also show elevated levels of anhedonia. Um, uh, it's tempting to speculate that they might be related to their anhedonia. That's something that could be tested more directly in a future study we don't know at this point. Um, likewise, uh, subtypes one and four show elevated levels of anxiety, and they share this um, finding of reduced functional connectivity between the ventral hippocampus amygdala and ventrolateral prefrontal areas. Um, we, we know from uh, Kevin Oxer and Tor Wager and many other people's work that uh, this uh, network seems to be important in regulating uh, negative affect and negative emotional states through cognitive reappraisal strategies. Um, so it might make sense that people who, have, uh, who could have deficits in this function might have higher levels of negative affect. Again, that's something that could be tested more directly um, in a future study. Um, uh, but, but what we do know is that the subtypes exhibit um, differences in their clinical symptom profiles, differences in their functional connectivity maps, um, and uh, importantly, they also predict differences in treatment response. Before I get there, I'm going to... Uh, uh, tell you a little bit of uh, uh, a little bit more about um, validation work that we did. Um, one set of analyses that I won't delve into too much here, but we can talk about more in the methods talk perhaps, um, uh, was uh, designed to develop uh, classifiers for diagnosing these um, subtypes in individual patients. Remember that currently we diagnose depression based on clinical symptoms. Um, 
and uh, there um, is no established way for identifying um, which subtype a person might belong to um, based on either their fMRI or their clinical symptoms, so we needed to develop an approach to accomplish this. Um, we optimize different methods for parcelating the brain, for uh, clustering, for classifying patients and differentiating them from uh, healthy controls. And um, what you can see here are the results of our optimization work. Um, uh, this is in leave one out cross-validation, uh, so importantly, um, probably the uh, accuracy rates would be somewhat lower um, in, uh, in um, a totally independent replication sample. I'm gonna come back to that in a second, as you'll see. Um, but what you can see is that um, by optimizing these different um, steps, we could improve our, our, our classification rates. Our worst performing classifiers at the left barely did better than chance. Our best performing classifiers at the right, the best performing one you see uh, denoted by the double asterisk, um, that uh, differentiated healthy controls and patients with um, high 80s percent accuracy, um, which we think um, is about as good as we're gonna get out of uh, the data that we have here. Um, here you see the sensitivity and specificity of these, uh, of these um, kind of diagnostic biomarkers um, for differentiating healthy subjects and, and, and depressed patients. Um, they range from uh, low 80s to high 80s, basically, um, uh, across the different subtypes. Um, Importantly, um, we, we could also um, validate uh, these results in a couple of different ways. Um, one way is to think about um, treatment, treatment response prediction, and that's what I'm about to describe, but there are other ways too, right? Um, one of them is how stable are they over time? Um, if these subtypes um, have a, uh, like a, a meaning um, that resembles the intu intuitive meaning of a depression subtype, you would think that if I'm depressed today and I'm diagnosed with subtype one and you rescan me in three or four weeks and I'm still depressed, I probably should still be diagnosed as subtype one. Um, on the other hand, if what we're clustering on is uh, some other um, uncontrolled variable um, that um, maybe uh, isn't related to depression subtypes in the intuitive sense of the word, you can imagine lots of them, um, what the person is thinking about in the scanner, how well they slept last night, whether they had a fight with their spouse or partner before they came into the, the, the lab that day. Lots of things could influence these data. Um, you might expect, if that were the case, that these, the, the clustering uh, diagnoses, the subtype diagnoses, would be less stable over time. And what we found was that overall, this is a much smaller sample of a, about 50 people who were scanned twice, four weeks apart, and were depressed at both time points. Um, you can see that most people at subtype one at time one were also also diagnosed with subtype one at time two, uh, and so on and so forth for the other subtypes. So they are stable over time, and importantly, we can also replicate them in an independent sample. So this is that second data set I mentioned. Um, as expected, the accuracy rates, again, in leave one out, uh, sorry, this is not, uh, at left you see leave one out cross-validation results. Um, at right, uh, you see just applying the best performing classifiers um, to new subjects from data set two and asking how well do they differentiate patients and controls, and um, they're not quite as good um, as the results uh, in leave one out cross-validation at the left, but they're still pretty good. Um, and importantly, we also think that they can probably be improved somewhat um, with uh, new neuroimaging data that was designed with this intent uh, in mind. Um, a lot of this data is uh, quite old, um, and uh, we've learned a lot about fMRI in the past 10 years, um, and we now know, for example, that one of the most important things is um, having uh, a long period of time that you're scanning your subjects for, um, and some of these probably are suboptimal in that respect. So we think it, it could potentially be improved um, with new data. Um, interestingly, how are we doing for time? Okay, good. Um, I'm gonna tell you about uh, two remaining findings and then there'll be plenty of time for questions. Um, one of them is, is what, you, what you're about to see, um, and that's uh, that these so-called depression subtypes actually cross conventional um, symptom-based diagnostic boundaries um, in interesting and maybe intuitively sensible ways. Um, so what I've shown you so far is that DSM assigns a single label, major depressive disorder, to people with at least four different kinds of altered connectivity in their brains. Um, we wanted to ask here whether DSM also does kind of the converse. Does it assign different labels to people who actually have similar brain um, functional connectivity patterns? And the diagnosis that we focused on here was, was generalized anxiety disorder. For any clinicians in the room, this, this decision will probably make sense to you. We know that, uh, that 
uh, depression and anxiety are related, um, that many kids who are anxious grow up to be depressed adults, that many depressed adults have comorbid anxiety symptoms, that uh, genetic risk for um, generalized anxiety and depression um, seem to be related. They run in families together. They respond um, to many of the same treatments. So these diagnoses, they're distinct in DSM, but they seem to share um, certain features. Um, and so we just asked how would our uh, classifiers um, treat patients with generalized anxiety disorder but not major depressive disorder. Um, one thing we found was that many of the connectivity features that are, and that's what you see uh, at the upper right, the Venn diagram, I there, can't really see that, um, the Venn diagram you see at the upper right depicts the overlap of connectivity features that are altered in depression, um, altered in, in generalized anxiety disorder, or both. And what you see is that they're not the same, right, there's a lot of non-overlap, but there is also a substantial amount of overlap, about 20% about 4%, I think, of the connectivity features that are altered in GAD are also altered in depression. Um, so that kind of further motivated um, uh, our uh, just kind of curiosity-driven analysis of whether um, and how these biomarkers would, would treat um, patients with GAD. Um, and what we found is what you see depicted here. Um, patients with GAD were actually uh, highly likely to test positive for two of our four subtypes. Um, about 31% of them tested negative. They were, they were identified as healthy controls, um, not depressed people, according to our, our, our biomarkers, our classifiers. But the remainder, the majority, um, tested positive for one of the subtypes. And interestingly, um, almost all of them tested positive for subtype one or subtype four. And you'll recall that subtypes one and subtype four are the subtypes that showed elevated levels of anxiety in the depressed sample at the bottom. Um, so we looked then at the clinical symptoms and how they varied by subtype in the, in, in the GAD sample. And what we found was that their anxiety symptoms as indexed by the back anxiety inventory, they didn't vary by subtype diagnosis. These are all anxious people. Um, they have high levels of, of, of anxiety. Um, but their depressive symptoms did. So if you tested positive for one of the subtypes, your depressive symptoms were likely to be substantially more severe than if you tested negative. Furthermore, we found that patients in the GAD sample who were uh, assigned to subtype three or four um, were more likely to exhibit more severe levels of anhedonia than patients who were assigned to subtype one, who in turn had higher levels than patients who were uh, categorized as not depressed. And, and that again maps uh, to what we saw in the depression only sample. Subtypes three and subtype four had higher levels of anhedonia. Um, so that's interesting. Um, but another nagging question in my mind was whether we might be uh, identifying not something, because now we're kind of transcending diagnostic boundaries. Um, is this specific to depression and anxiety at all, or, or is this kind of a generalized marker for psychopathology, for something going wrong in the brain in a nonspecific way, um, in a way that would be perhaps less interesting, um, or, or maybe interesting for different reasons? Um, and so we wanted to ask next whether uh, these Biomarkers applied to patients with a different diagnosis that we would not expect to be so related to depression as a kind of negative control, um, how, how patients with schizophrenia um, would look. Um, and, and what we found was that uh, it was a very different pattern. Um, um, almost all of these people were categorized as uh, not depressed. And we've looked at this in a lot of different ways. Schizophrenic brains uh, do not look like actively depressed brains um, by, by all sorts of measures. That's not to say that there's no overlap, um, but uh, our, our uh, classifiers, our biomarkers, are identifying some kind of uh, alteration in con functional connectivity in the brain that, uh, that relates to depression and anxiety, but, uh, but um, uh, does not map to schizophrenia, that apparently does not occur in schizophrenia. Um, okay, uh, lastly, and maybe most importantly, um, how do these subtypes um, relate to treatment response? Um, you don't need a brain scan, certainly, to diagnose depression. A lot of times, you don't even need any clinical training. You can see it on the, the, the face of a friend or loved one. Um, on the other hand, uh, biomarkers would be really useful for informing treatment selection decisions. Um, the, those are much harder to make. They're, uh, as I said before, often trial and error, um, and it would be great to have some kind of information um, in advance of giving a treatment that would tell me something about the patient's likelihood of responding to that treatment. Um, and I told you we would come back to this dorsomedial prefrontal area um, that, uh, again, this is just a reproduction of the figure I showed you a few minutes ago, um, exhibit, 
uh, denoting which brain regions showed the most um, subtype specific connectivity features, and one of them was that um, red dorsomedial prefrontal cortical area. Um, and, it, and that area was of interest to us because it happens to be um, a, a, a therapeutically useful target for transcranial magnetic stimulation for depression. Um, it's not the FDA cleared most common target, which is left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, um, but uh, Jonathan Downer, our collaborator at the University of Toronto, and, and many, and, and others as well, have shown in hundreds of patients that uh, stimulating this area repetitively using uh, TMS is an effective treatment for depression. For people unfamiliar with TMS, TMS is a, is a non-invasive neurostimulation intervention that, that is FDA cleared for, for treating depression. It works by delivering a rapidly fluctuating magnetic field to the brain, which um, we, we think um, uh, regulates spiking um, uh, brain activity in, in, the re in the region being stimulated. And um, for reasons that aren't well understood, repetitive TMS over um, a few weeks um, tends to relieve depressive symptoms in many people, but not in all people. Um, and that part is important too, because if you're a patient who's about to undergo this therapy, um, which means coming into a clinic, it's non-invasive, um, it's relatively side effect free, um, patients tolerate it well, you come to the office, you leave um, in about an hour, but it does mean committing to coming to the office five days a week for five weeks, um, so it's not for everyone, and it's um, especially disappointing when someone does that for five weeks and then learns uh, that it didn't work for them. And so it would be great if we could tell them something in advance about um, whether it's likely to work or not. Um, and we also know from um, many others' work that your likelihood of responding to TMS is at least loosely related to um, functional connectivity measures um, as indexed by resting state fMRI acquired prior to treatment. So we just asked a really simple question. Let's collaborate with Jonathan Downer um, at Toronto. Let's ask in, in his patients who he scanned before treatment and then treated them with TMS and we know which ones get better and which ones don't. Um, if we subtype all of them, do their, do their treatment response patterns differ by subtype? Um, and what we found was that they did. Patients in subtype one were quite likely to respond well to TMS. Um, uh, patients in subtypes two and four were not likely at all to respond well to TMS targeting this site. And uh, patients in subtype three uh, showed sort of an intermediate level of response. Um, you see that depicted in two different ways here in panels A and B. Um, Kind of skip this, just suffice it to say that there are um, connectivity features that um, relate to your likelihood of responding. Um, and uh, that motivated an effort to, um, kind of similar to what we did with diagnosis a minute ago, can we train classifiers, um, biomarkers, um, for predicting treatment response in individual patients um, uh, based on uh, different kinds of features? Um, First, we just asked, um, let's forget about the subtype diagnosis. What if we just use connectivity features? How well do those classifiers perform? And what you see here are the results, again, in leave one out cross-validation, about 78% accurate. Um, uh, so pretty good accuracy, um, maybe not quite where you would want it um, to use in widespread clinical practice for a neuroimaging modality that might be expensive, um, but uh, promising. Um, importantly, um, in panel G, you see adding in the subtype diagnosis significantly improves the accuracy of, of, of those classifications up to around 87, 90% in leave one out cross-validation. Um, that in turn, that tells us something about subtype diagnosis being useful. We also know that subtype, the subtypes vary in terms of their clinical symptoms. So maybe we don't need the brain scan at all. Maybe we can just use the clinical symptoms to predict um, response and that would be much cheaper. Um, and uh, a more effective way of, of doing this. And so we just ask, let's do the same thing with clinical symptoms, but no fMRI measures. And here we see um, not as good results. These are statistically significant because we have about 125 people here, um, but it's not that much better than chance flipping a coin, right? And so it's not really useful enough to contemplate using this in a, in a clinical setting. Um, and that actually is kind of consistent with what many others have observed, that uh, there probably are uh, modest relationships between um, particular clinical symptoms and treatment response with this, with this intervention, but they aren't so strong. Um, lastly, we could also uh, replicate these results um, in, a, in a second sample, um, also from Toronto. Um, we're, we're currently um, working, uh, getting started on a, a much larger prospective trial that would allow us to uh, to test in a much more rigorous way whether this approach is useful for predicting treatment response and, and most importantly, like uh, maybe it's accurate um, to some degree, but does the level of accuracy actually enable you to, to significantly improve um, response rates, which is, which is a slightly different but more clinically important uh, question. Um, 
Okay. Uh, and in the last like couple of minutes, there'll be plenty of time for questions. I'll just tell you about a couple of interesting directions here. Um, so remember that most of the patients that I've just told you about have moderate to severe depressive symptoms. Um, and uh, um, like most patients who get TMS, um, it's not the first line treatment. Most of them have failed um, at least one and usually two or more antidepressant treatments um, like uh, medications before coming to a TMS clinic. So they're sick. Um, and we're not really contemplating uh, not treating them. Um, they all need treatment. So a, a more relevant clinical question really isn't whether I should give you this treatment or not give you this treatment. It's um, whether I should give you treatment A or treatment B. Which one is more likely to be effective for you? Um, and so we, we wanted to ask whether um, there might be some utility in predicting not just your response to this particular target, dorsomedial prefrontal, but your differential response to that target or the FDA-cleared left dorsolateral target. Um, what you see at left uh, is our, our box plots depicting um, the response to TMS um, in patients who got one of these one of these treatments, dorsolateral or dorsomedial prefrontal, um, and you can see that they work. Um, uh, the, the median is around 40 to 50 percent um, uh, improvement in symptoms, um, but there's a lot of variability, right? Some people um, have no symptoms at the end of the treatment. Some people um, have shown no response and their symptoms are even a little worse. Um, and so that's not good if you're a patient. Um, uh, that can be discouraging, um, but it's useful from a statistical perspective because it tells you that there's a lot of variance here and there's some potential um, for uh, for, for predicting um, different response rates. Um, maybe the people who don't respond well to one of them will respond better to the other. Um, and so uh, I'm going to skip this part and just jump to the punchline so that there's time for questions. Um, and that's this. Um, so we reasoned that individual differences in treatment response might be related to at least two factors. One of them could be diagnostic heterogeneity. Um, I've shown you that DSM assigns this one label to people with very different connectivity maps. Um, to the extent that these maps are related to your likelihood of responding, that tells you maybe that different patients with different connectivity alterations might be more or less likely to respond to a, to a particular treatment. Um, they might also be related, and this is an area of um, uh, increasing interest in this field, um, they might also be related to variable brain wiring patterns. Um, in other words, um, the, for the variation in the capacity to engage a target that's important in depression. Maybe there's something abnormal buried deep in the brain, um, and in some patients that's strongly connected to the dorsomedial target site for TMS, and in others it's more weakly connected, and so your, your capacity to engage that pathology deeper in the brain brain is, is diminished in some people. Um, and so we just asked, um, could we model the expected clinical response to RTMS targeting uh, the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex or the dorsomedial prefrontal cortex in a fairly sizable sample of 295 for one, 154 th for the other. We fit models to predict response to each target based on a, a, a combination of clinical symptoms, um, subtype specific connectivity um, features, and, and baseline functional connectivity mapping. And then we asked, um, can we select a, a treatment target based on uh, differential response prediction? Um, and importantly, before I show you the actual data, these are um, three possible scenarios that we were, we were anticipating, I want to emphasize that none of these people actually got both treatments, right? So I'm here, I'm uh, uh, predicting response to one treatment, um, developing a model for that, and applying that to the other group of patients who didn't get that treatment. And the goal is to understand um, how your likelihood of responding to one treatment might relate to your likelihood of responding to another, which is important for the reason I'm about to illustrate right here. Um, there are different ways they could be related, right? Um, and those different ways would have different implications for whether this is likely to be helpful or not helpful. Um, one disappointing outcome would be the one you see pictured at right. If, if your likelihood of responding to one treatment was kind of linearly correlated with your likelihood of responding to the other treatment, I don't really need a brain scan to, to tell you about your likelihood. It, it, it doesn't matter. If you're likely to respond to one, you're also likely to respond to another, uh, and vice versa if you're a non-responder. And so uh, there wouldn't be much potential for improving treatment response rates, even if you had a super accurate model. Um, it just wouldn't matter. 
um, at least not for these two treatments. On the other hand, the, the best case scenario might be what you see it depicted that left where pretty much everyone who's a, who's, who's a predicted left dorsolateral non-responder is predicted to respond strongly to dorsomedial prefrontal and vice versa. And then you'd predict I could have a big impact on, on, on antidepressant responses um, by, by making this prediction in advance and selecting the right treatment. Um, and what we observed was something closer to the middle scenario, um, where um, many patients were predicted to respond to, uh, to um, both treatments, um, but um, many were also predicted to respond to only one of them. Um, either at the upper left, uh, dorsolateral prefrontal, or at the lower right, um, likely to respond only to dorsomedial prefrontal and not the other treatment. Um, and uh, some were predicted to respond to neither. We might want to try a different treatment in these people. Um, but what this tells us um, is that uh, this approach to modeling differential response um, predi uh, prediction um, might be useful for improving response rates, and we could actually, um, based on the um, the observed responses um, and uh, and our prediction of um, how they're distributed with respect to one another, we can make some uh, predictions about um, how effective uh, uh, this strategy would be in improving response rates. Um, and, and that's what you see depicted at right. Um, a, a subtype guided target selection strategy we think might improve response rates from around 38 uh, percent to a, a little north of 60 percent, which, um, which uh, you know, isn't perfect, um, but it, it, it could mean a lot for some people. Um, so we think this is promising. This is something important that we really need to test prospectively um, in, in independent data going forward in a, like, randomized, controlled, blinded kind of way, and that's something we intend to do um, starting soon. Um, with that, I just want to highlight um, some of the people who, again, contributed to this work. Um, Andrew Drysdale and Mark Dubin um, were, were, were uh, key in driving the work forward and, and, and generating the data. Also, my collaborator, um, Faith Gunning at Cornell and Jonathan Downer at Toronto, um, who are working closely with me in the uh, clinical trial um, that, we're, that we're about to start for differential response prediction. And again, the folks you see highlighted in red who shared their data and, and made this work possible. And uh, I'll stop with that. And uh, do we have a couple minutes for some questions? Uh, just connectivity features, no symptoms, yeah. Um, unfortunately, that's an interesting question. I'd love to ask, ask that question, too. Um, the data that we had available to us, we didn't have Hamilton depression rating scale or clinical data or really much that's depression-related in the schizophrenia patients in the sample that we had. It would be really interesting to test that. If you do the CCA analysis just with, uh, on subjects within a subtype, I didn't do that. Uh, I don't know the results. Um, I would guess they would be different because you have a very different variance, right? Like the people within a subtype are going to have similar clinical symptoms. Um, and so there, there won't be much variance in like anhedonia, for example, because they all have high anhedonia. Um, and like PCA, the CCA is like looking for a low dimensional space that explains a lot of the variance. So I bet they would be different, but I didn't test that. Uh, yes? Um, so I was wondering in your original data set, the hundreds of patients, um, do you know what happens in, when, they are, you know, when they go through antidepressant treatment, practice antidepressant treatment, especially the ones who have clinical alleviation of symptoms? Is there any change in their responses to medication? Yeah, we are really interested in that question, um, and we are just starting to look at it. Um, we didn't have that data available to us originally. We do now. Um, collaborators have, have shared some of that data pre and post scans on people treated with conventional antidepressants. So I don't know yet. I also don't know whether the subtypes vary in their likelihood of responding to conventional antidepressants or whether they change. The change question uh, is super interesting. It's actually like uh, something that we're really focused on now in my lab, but uh, we're just getting started. I don't have anything to tell you, unfortunately, yet. Alan? 
basically a, a method for explaining the, the clinical manifestation in terms of, of that particular system that you just described. So, so the question is related to the clinical exclusion. And it looked at the genetic sequencing in these dogs. So <laughs> Maybe we'll, we'll come back to it. Um, uh, yeah, uh, as as to whether they differ, um, like you might imagine, uh, you might imagine like a candidate gene approach, like uh, like like uh, the, the Meyer Lindenberg approach, um, uh, motivated by the work he's already done, um, uh, where, where we could ask whether like particular SNPs that we know from his work are important here, whether they vary by subtype. You might also imagine looking at like. Uh, SNPs identified in GWAS, um, whether or not we know about their functional role. Um, in long story short, uh, uh, in the data that we had, no blood, no G no DNA, um, unfortunately. Um, but we are collecting that um, in all of the subjects scanned at Cornell going forward, and we think we probably um, uh, will have some collaborators soon who who have that data too, and will allow us to ask that question. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting questions you might ask about relating um, various kinds of molecular measures to, to uh, brain function. Um, it's something we want to do, but I don't have results yet. Uh, yes? Absolutely. Um, great question. I didn't really, that was a, a lot of complicated work that I totally glossed over. Um, uh, a short answer to your question that I wasn't described is what are we optimizing on? And the answer is uh, uh, accuracy rates for differentiating healthy controls and depressed patients. Um, uh, remember, there is no gold standard for accuracy rates in differentiating the subtypes um, because the subtypes were identified in the same sample. Um, but. Uh, we can optimize on like how well you're able to differentiate patients and controls, um, and uh, uh, I will. I'll t so I'll tell you that like um, we 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 use different methods of parcellation, um, and they do not all perform equally. Um, but um, it's uh, functional parcellations perform better than others, um, and uh, functional parcellations with a like. Um, just right number of um, nodes, um, probably based on the sample size, um, perform better than like voxel-wise parcellations where we just look at every voxel, um, uh, and uh, likewise perform better than um, very coarse parcellations that have just like you know ten brain regions or something like that, um, and that probably relates to the um, the uh, well as you increase the number of nodes. Um, you're getting more functionally precise brain regions, um, but as you add too many, um, you have a feature selection and overfitting problem. Um, uh, and so that's what we think that tells us. Um, I'll also talk, I don't really, ha didn't have time here, but I'll talk a, a lot more in the methods lecture about um, uh, what we did to evaluate the stability of the clustering um, in various ways um, with different combinations of parcellations and like was, in other words, like were these clusters really sensitive to the particular pre-processing um, and analysis decisions that we made here, um, or are they really robust? And we think the answer is that they're um, fairly robust, but pre-processing is also important. Um, and, and maybe most importantly, they're definitely a product of the data we had at hand, um, uh, and that's important to think about too. Um, so, uh, there is uh, going to be a break now, and then he's going to come back and give another talk at 2. So um, I I just in the interest of time, and I know we have a number of students, I think we're going to cut it off now. Please come and ask questions if you have some additional questions. Oh, at 1.30, 1.30, the second talk. Uh, and um, 
please stay, like I said, for the second lecture if you're able to. But I would really like to take this opportunity to, to extend a very sincere thank you for coming and giving us this lovely presentation today, which is a perfect fit for, uh, for the Lumber Center's goals and, and mission and a really nice mixture of results and methods. And uh, thank you. Thank you.